of both the water depth and the different types of oil that exist in order to um, basically have an informed response strategy in the future. Third, what are the resources at risk from a potential oil spill at any location in the Gulf? Obviously, resource planners need to know what potential resources are at risk in order to authorize drilling in a particular location. There are probably some places, there are some places in the Gulf that are simply too fragile um, to um, have a spill of any dimension uh, in terms of the resources potentially at risk. One of the uh, sets of studies that um, CMIGE has been doing is to, number one, combine uh, hydrodynamic modeling, that is modeling the particle flow of an oil release with the baseline information collected for totally different purposes of the uh, fish eggs and larval distributions throughout the Gulf. And what we found is that um, uh, even if the deep water horizon occurred at a different season, it would have dramatically changed the types of resources that would be impacted. And as well, we've simulated oil spills on the West Florida Shelf and then out in the Western Gulf, and they too have much different potential impact. If we're resource planners in terms of authorizing the drilling, we need that information before an oil spill happens in order to make informed decisions. Next, how would surface and subsurface oil spills move? At what rates and in response to what factors? The interesting thing is prior to the Deepwater Horizon spill, um, oil spills were considered a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional uh, feature. That is a surface spill occurring over time and so aircraft monitoring and satellites and um, hydrodynamic models of the sea surface were the state of the art. Clearly, um, the Deepwater Horizon as an unprecedented four-dimensional um, oil spill has resulted in the necessity of actually understanding and forecasting where these deep plumes go, um, both at the surface and the subsurface. Um, those models are under development, but that should be a critical response strategy for the next oil spill. Uh, next, what are the environmental consequences of oil spill response measures? That is burning, the use dis of dispersants, the creation of sand berms, um, and the fresh water releases. Um, could it be that the cure is, is worse than the disease? Uh, in many cases, um, we have to carefully evaluate the environmental trade-offs of all these mechanisms, and the Deepwater Horizon gave us a flavor of all of these things. And so understanding <coughs> these trade-offs uh, in terms of making informed decisions the next time as opposed to the ad hoc nature of the decision making that was made during Deepwater Horizon is important. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, can uh, ultra deep drilling and production be accomplished with greatly re reduced risk and environmental damage? Ultra deep wells are those that are uh, 5,000 feet and deeper. Uh, a decade ago, um, there was a, a little work in ultra. Now a substantial fraction of the nearly 500 million barrels taken out of the Gulf of Mexico each year is from ultra deep wells. It's because they're so productive relative to the played out wells that are in shallower water. But what is the environmental risk um, of those ultra deep wells relative to the, the benefit to society? And that's a much larger contextual debate. So just to illustrate a couple of points, um, the graphic you see in front of you, each one of those yellow dots, uh, uh, those 4,000 yellow dots on this page, represents an oil and gas um, uh, uh, infrastructure facility. And so you can see that um, basically they exist from Mobile Bay out to the uh, Mexican boundary. Um, by law, uh, uh, drilling is not currently allowed in the area east of Mobile Bay. Uh, and off of the West Florida Shelf. Certainly, um, there will be enormous pressure as the industry moves into ever deeper water around the U.S. and uh, Mexican uh, border um, as the industry moves deeper, and also probably more pressure to drill at least at the edge of the continental shelf off Florida over time. Um, th the issue about um, you know resources at risk. Um, what you see here is a plot of uh, standardized data that we get on fish egg and larval distributions relative to the Deepwater Horizon spill, but also the two stars represent the simulations that we've done in terms of what would the resources at risk be. And so one could select any point um, in um, the Gulf of Mexico and run the forecasting models of, of where um, the particles would go and understand the impacts on these resources. So this represents an important planning tool. And it also emphasizes, I think, one of the overarching goals of CMIGE and the research conducted by all of our co collaborating institutions. And that is, we are academics doing research, but we're not 
doing academic research. We're doing research that actually is supposed to help the policy decision and policy making uh, apparatus in the United States. And so we're trying to focus this research on practical um, things that we need to know in terms of actually assisting this industry and assisting society in making these tough choices. So um, I, I suppose the um, last real big issue we have is what will the Gulf look like uh, in the next five years and in fact in 30 years. And so um, some of the research that um, we're going to be uh, fortunate enough to conduct over the next three years um, with the large continuation grant that we got from the uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative will address some of these issues. And we wanted to touch very briefly on um, the notion of what we're going to be doing with um, the money that we've been granted over the next three years. And I think some of these studies are, from our point of view, scientifically very exciting. Um, first of all, we're going to be monitoring the changes in the sedimentary system in the fishes over time. As I said before, one way we can back into baselines mm -hmm. is to understand what's happening in these fishes, uh, not only in terms of their contamination level, but the sublethal impacts on um, th their reproduction, their growth rates, and other things that are important that determine physiology. And so we'll be monitoring in this uh, northern Gulf of Mexico area, uh, doing a cruise that um, David and I like to call the mud and blood cruise, where we go out and sample the fish and sample the mud at the same time. It's a fascinating cruise. Um, um, enjoy it a lot. We all learn from each other in terms of you know, the multi-dimensional aspects of research. So we'll be doing mud and blood for the next three years. Um, uh, secondly, and this is really exciting, um, that is um, there, you can only understand so much about environmental contamination by actually sampling the animals in the ocean. Um, these animals that we sample in the ocean have an unknown exposure history, and we try to understand that by looking at the various tissues. The best way to do this is to actually do controlled experimentation in the laboratory. And so with our association with the Moat Marine Lab and the Moat Aquaculture Park, we're going to be undertaking probably the most comprehensive set of exposure uh, trials ever undertaken with, with oil, uh, in, in particular using adult fishes. And so we're going to be using these four species, which represent um, a continuum of the different life histories of animals in the Gulf of Mexico. The Florida pompano, which is a small pelagic fish that uh, swims in, in midwater depths. Um, the red drum, which uh, everybody who's a sport fisherman knows uh, red drum are uh, important estuarine dependent fish. The red snapper, which we've talked about before. And the gulf flounder, which is a bottom dwelling fish. And we'll be exposing them uh, in, a, in a really interesting design that looks, first of all, at chronic low-level exposures. Now, we know that uh, oil is in the Gulf, and oil is released continuously from leaking infrastructure, from uh, outfall from the Mississippi River, from natural seeps. And so understanding what the um, impacts of that chronic low-level exposure are are important. Over and above that, um, we can also expose these animals to acute high-level exposure, like uh, was in the Deepwater Horizon, and probably the most closest to um, the real world situation, what happens when you have a chronic low level exposure and an acute high level exposure over the top? Our theory is that the underlying mechanisms for animals to clear oil may be actually degraded over time by chronic exposure to the point where they can't respond uh, uh, very quickly relative to a single acute event. And so by doing these controlled exposures, we can actually get a Rosetta Stone to interpret the field data that we've been collecting. And I want to make uh, one important announcement w relative to this, um, this set of trials, and that is uh, today we're announcing a partnership between uh, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, University of South Florida, and Agilent uh, Incorporated, which makes a lot of the analytical devices that we, uh, we use for this kind of testing. And this is a great partnership where we've put a little money in the pool, and Agilent's put a lot of money into the pool to buy some state-of-the-art sophisticated instruments. And you know we're um, pleased to have uh, Adam Woodhouse and Elaine Rasicki here today from Agilent, who are our partners in this endeavor. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, the, one of the next major initiatives we have is uh, what we're calling Return to Ixtoc. And David uh, alluded to the uh, notion that um, this wasn't the, lo the first major oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, uh, in 1979 and 1980, there was a major oil spill off the Campeche region 
in um, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the, the spill itself was at about 50 meters depth or about 150 feet, but it was perched on the edge of a major submarine canyon there. During that spill, uh, which ran for nine months before the well was contained, um, nearly three-quarters as much volume was released uh, by that spill as Deepwater Horizon, and as well an enormous quantity of corexit was used uh, in dispersants. What you see here is a really interesting photograph. It was a shallow well, and so rather than having the methane eaten by microbes on a mile-long trip from the bottom to the surface, this methane came up to the surface and started burning. And so that, that well burned like that for a long time. Um, what we're going to do is do an expedition back there because um, we know from some of the work that we've already conducted that a uh, substantial fraction of the oil from Ixtoc also lies on the sea bottom. And so our idea here is basically to use the past to predict the future. Um, just in terms of some statistics about the, uh, the Ixtoc spill, you can see these are um, some renditions of what happened there. And that spill theoretically went west and north. And in fact, uh, uh, part of that spill went all the way up to the Texas coast. Um, uh, we have been conducting a variety of studies and working with some Mexican colleagues. And um, much as we've taken core samples from the uh, Deepwater Horizon, we also obtained some core samples that our Mexican colleagues have uh, obtained there as well. And you can see um, these are the core samples from the Mexican uh, uh, episode. And you can see it looks almost exactly like the uh, core samples that David told you about, except they're buried under four inches of sediment, which is exactly what you would predict after 35 years of sediment accumulation. So we think that by doing these comparative studies, we can actually uh, forecast into the future what the deep waters around Deepwater Horizon will look like 35 years from now in terms of the toxicity uh, and the impact on the environment. Now, one of the important aspects of looking at these is that um, if, in fact, uh, marine worms and other uh, critters that live in the uh, sediments were quite active, you would see the sediment kind of uh, blurred uh, in terms of what we call bioturbation. The fact that we don't see strong bioturbation after 35 years really should give us pause about the toxicity of that event, even 35 years hence. So, uh, so in terms of some of the other things, um, we actually um, are um, mounting an expedition with the Weatherbird to sample completely in the Gulf of Mexico in the, on the continental shelves. And we've been working with the Mexican government to get permission for the, uh, the Weatherbird to actually go into Mexican waters. And we just completed our application today. We have strong support from the Mexican universities that are doing this partnership and some interactions with the Mexican uh, officials that would allow this. The idea here is to basically get the baselines that the industry has never surrendered. And that is using the weather bird and the sampling procedures that we use. We're going to sample along all of the transects that you see throughout the Campeche region in Mexico, up through the Texas coast, around to Louisiana, and then complement that with the samples we've already taken, which are the dots here. So we will have the most comprehensive baseline in sediments and fish ever collected for the Gulf of Mexico, and hopefully put in the industry to shame a little bit. Um, la lastly, um, the, as, as Dr. Hollander said, there are enormous questions that um, still surround the controversial, controversial use of dispersants um, at the wellhead. Um, th there are models and uh, some uh, intriguing uh, experimental results that indicate that perhaps that was a very minor component of the formation of those deep uh, plumes. If that's the case, then why authorize nearly a million gallons of dispersants to be used at the wellhead if it's basically um, not doing anything useful? And so this remains an extremely controversial result. Um, the industry wants to be authorized to do this not only in the United States but elsewhere in the world when uh, blowouts occur. The only way really to understand this problem is to go to first principles. And so um, the three facilities um, that are partners in this um, this consortium, Hamburg, Calgary, uh, and West Australia, have high pressure uh, units like the one you see on the far um, left that we can actually create the deep water horizon oil spill and microcosm. So um, there's a small jet at the bottom of these high pressure cells, um, which can be actually inflated to um, 550 times the pressure at the of the atmosphere at sea level. 
uh, and then we can inject oil and then oil and dispersant mixes. And there's a, a, a camera, that, um, an endoscopic camera that can be put down to measure very precisely the droplet size formation. Uh, and so we will get to the bottom of this question about whether the dispersants actually made any difference in terms of the formation of small droplets, which are so critical to this question of deep plume formation. Uh, it, a, apart from a bunch of the new initiatives and continuing research, there are a number of aspects of our um, consortium and, in fact, academic science um, uh, writ large that are so important to the oil spill response. Uh, first, uh, obviously, training the next generation of oil spill scientists and responders, and, and you can see a number of the students and, and postdocs um, in the room here today, um, they are our best bet for um, a vigorous response to the next oil spill. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I'll be long gone by the next time that happens, but they certainly won't be. And then, and then uh, as we're doing today, informing the public about the risks and consequences of oil spill extraction policies. That is, um, trying to use the power of independent science to make sure that we're fair arbiters of this debate we, uh, upon which so much of the economy of the Gulf rests, and, and that certainly is a role that, that we have. So with, with that, um, we certainly want to remember, uh, and we, we need not forget, um, the importance of that spill in terms of the loss of human life. And, and um, uh, you can see the names here. Um, each of these was, was fathers to other people, and I think there are 21 children without uh, a father um, uh, today uh, because of that, that oil spill, and, and we certainly need to pause to remember that this is not just a science issue. And then last, um, what we'd like to do is turn now to our panel discussion and answer any questions that the media and others might have. And so, um, as before, um, Dr. Wetzel and Dr. Hastings uh, will be joined by Dr. Hollander and myself, and I'll kind of moderate the questions. So uh, with that, uh, we'd certainly like to open the floor. Okay, I can explain that. It was not my work, but I think I can interpret it. Uh, and if I miss something, Steve. I'm um, so uh, there are certain components in oil that we try and monitor uh, uh, to give us some sense of the toxicity. And for oil, we generally monitor what's called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So each of those little histo bars that you saw represented one compound of the PAHs, which is what we call uh, that class of compounds. And so on one side, you saw the sediment pH concentration. On the other side, you saw what was found in the liver of the fish. So going down, you can make that comparison of concentration of one pH in the sediment versus that same pH in the liver. Maybe I can just make one point of clarification. Actually. The, the histogram on the left was the actual crude oil, was the actual Macondo oil, like the sample that Representative Castor was able to provide. <coughs> so what the comparison is, is actually the crude oil with what one sees in the fish livers. And that similarity uh, is indisputable. I'm not sure who the, I'm sorry, I'm Jeff Patterson with WFLA. And I'm not sure who the best person to answer this question is, but even today, BP was maintaining uh, that the environment has returned and that the scope of the spill was limited in time and geography. Um, based on the research that you all have done, what have you found about that? I think the scientific community would argue about that. There are parts that seem to be more resilient than we had expected. Uh, a lot of times the response is that there is no significant concentrations, which in their parlance is, tox is lethal concentrations. Uh, the overwhelming number of samples that were collected both in the water and in the sediments were not at lethal concentration, but actually sub-lethal concentrations. <coughs> and the map of the sediments reflected 1,200 square miles, uh, which were actually quite severely impacted, not just a three-kilometer <laughs> ring around the wellhead. Uh, there is heterogeneity. There, it's not homogeneously responding. The recovery is not homogeneous. There's still significant oil in the bottom. Uh, 
Uh, it's uh, repeatedly soiling the coastline when storms come up, so it's apparently located also uh, adjacent to the beaches. There's still oil in the marshes. It's a question of what do you see as a significant impact. Lethality is, you're over, it's done. Sublethal is something quite discreet and distinct. For example, as an analogy, if you were to have a can of paint, you open that can of paint and you stick your nose in it and take a couple of good deep breaths, you could get dizzy, a headache, and have some pretty negative responses, a more lethal effect. But if you were to take that paint and paint the walls of your room with that paint, shut the doors, shut the window, go lie down to sleep for eight hours, you could wake up with a headache with dizziness. The concentrations that you were breathing were substantially lower, but the impacts, albeit protracted, can be identical or even more expressed in organisms. If they don't die, they're still alive. Their behavior could be changed. Their reproduction could be changed. Their growth could be changed. And I don't know how many of you are, are scuba divers in the ocean, um, but you don't see too many dead fish on the bottom of the ocean. And that's because when you do have problems behaviorally or not able to be as effective, you turn out to be food. So the impacts of these can be quite severe. Uh, one seeing recruitment of the red snapper, the small red snapper in the eastern Gulf of Mexico that has dropped dramatically comparatively. These are the kind of long-term assessments that need to be taken into consideration. And I think others had called it premature and perhaps um, inaccurate, and I, I think the academic community would uh, fall into that group. So are the fisheries can, still being impacted? Can, can I chime in just to uh, follow up on Dr. Hollander? You know, this was a huge event. We, we all know that. And if we didn't, if there was no evidence of any recovery, that would be very surprising. So the research that I've been doing with Africa College students has shown that there is substantial and significant effects in the sediments and for three years we saw large changes and then in year four and five we we're beginning to see some recovery and that's a good thing and we would expect to see a recovery this was a huge imp uh, impact on uh, on ocean systems and if we didn't see any recovery that would actually be very very surprising so we do see some evidence of recovery and thank goodness in fact natural systems are very resilient I mean, the, the analogy that Dr. Hollander gave of, of breathing toxic fumes, in fact, a week later, the headache would go away. And, and natural systems are very resilient. And for that, we have to be very grateful about the resilience. And yet, we still don't have a good understanding of these sublethal effects. So the work that we're seeing in the sediments is not that fish are dying. These are, these are sublethal effects, and they're still very important. And we also need to consider what we really don't know yet, because we don't have a good baseline, because five years in the course of science